Welcome to episode seven of the Creative Train podcast. It is pouring rain here today. This is a Saturday. Normally I record on Tuesday. So you may catch some interesting ASMR vibes of the uh, thunder outside and the rain on my skylight in my attic studio. But I was super inspired to finally get this done today after having to put it off for a whole week. Just last week didn't work out for me for anything fun. Today, we're going to talk about teaching and how to deal with problem students. All aboard. So yeah, this is not maybe what you would think the problem students title would be about. It's not about bad behavior in your students, but it's the ones that are truly exceptional and keep you constantly challenged as a teacher. I saw a funny pie chart once of an average musician's life, and it was basically 10% practice, 10% gigging, and 80% fearing child prodigies. And these folks always get recognized early and are often given opportunities to showcase their talents. And I've seen it on more than a few occasions in the music business that a more established artist will attach themselves to the prodigy as a mentor. And this more established artist can also book the big gigs and feature the up and comer. And sometimes if the new up and comer has an established social media following, maybe they've had some viral moments, but they aren't quite big enough to warrant larger venues booking them. These established artists, very benevolent in their efforts, they get to, in a strange sort of way, ride the coattails of this new viral sensation. Well, if you can't beat them, you might as well make your name synonymous with theirs, right? As a teacher, though, you may have experienced the same kind of thing with a student who excels way faster than any of their peers or anyone in your current roster of students. So what do you do with them? What do you do for them? My personal example of this early on in my life was I was a very good reader from grades one through four, and I was seen as exceptional by teachers. And in my very small four-room school, teachers didn't know quite how to handle me. So I became treated as some sort of problem, an easy target for ridicule. And instead of getting different or more challenging work, I was often made to feel like I was doing something wrong. And this made a large impact on me in my early school years and in the years following that. Because if you can't keep those students motivated and encouraged, those students will often withdraw. They'll often be less quick to answer. They'll sometimes even fall into patterns of answering incorrectly so that they cannot stand out, so that they won't stand out. So they recoil into this state of self-preservation and harbor some kind of shame over their talents. Rather than being encouraged to dig deeper and push a little harder than the rest, they find that it's easier to make themselves less in order to fit in better. In music, it was often the same thing for me as a child and into my early teens. I just got it easier than many of my peers. And as a result, I drew the ire and ridicule of my teachers, and especially my musical peers, who always seemed to think I was showing off. And that's the thing, because I had already been kind of beaten down in my very early school years. I had come to feel a certain sense of shame about my talents. And absolutely, I had to reach outside of my social circle to find proper, satisfying, creative outlets. So at the age of 14, I began playing in bands with folks many years older than me. And I never sought any spotlight or favor of any kind. But these opportunities just seemed to come my way. I'd go to these pubs or bars with handwritten letters from my mom saying that she gave me permission to be there 
for the purposes of playing music. And I never took advantage of that by trying to get alcohol or anything like that. I just went in and did my thing, packed up my gear at the end of the night and waited for my ride. This isn't all supposed to be about me, but I wanted to let you in on my backstory to help you better understand my approach with exceptional students. Firstly, I treat every student with equal respect and compassion in their journey, especially at the beginning when they're a lot more sensitive to the feeling of not being good yet. And this is with adults and kids alike. So after a few weeks, you'll notice that a student will have exceptional progress based on what you've seen folks their age do. And I had a funny example. I had one student a few years ago come to me, very timid, very shy. He was in grade eight, right? So he'd be about 13 years old. He comes into his first lesson with his ukulele. And I like to ask people what made them want to take lessons, what motivates them, what music do they like? And this, this fellow already knew a bunch of chords. He knew about note names, but not really how to find them on the instrument. And the first song that he chose that he wanted to do was Dead or Alive by Bon Jovi. And that's a pretty awesome song to play on guitar. There's lots of different levels of things to play in there. And it's not really a ukulele song. You can't really play everything on the ukulele from that song. And so we progressed for a couple of months, really, on ukulele. And at one point I said to him, when his mom was there, I said, you realize you're a guitar player with a ukulele in your hands, right? And you've, you've come to see the shortcomings of the instrument. And not long after that, he showed up with a guitar. And that's when he really began to flourish. It was so cool to see. That was, you know, just before the pandemic. And he had been with me for about a year and a half at that point. And he had branched out into bass guitar and keyboard at that time. So he had a ukulele, he had an electric and an acoustic guitar and two different bass guitars. And I could see some of his things that he was posting on his social media were just fantastic. He had taken every piece of information I tried to impart on him and digested it and made it his own. This is where, as a teacher, you are pressed into your ultimate act of service in that how much will you offer these exceptional students during their regular lesson times that's not normally part of a regular, typical music lesson. So what I had done was I, I offered him some opportunities to play a song or two on his own or with me at some of my gigs. And I also offered to do some proper audio recordings for him so he could really have a chance to hear himself and feel a certain level of legitimacy that just simply playing ukulele in the grade eight school band wouldn't have given him. And then as the pandemic did with everything else, it shut us down. And I didn't see him for a couple of years, but I did keep tabs on him, I guess you could say, through his social media. And watching him flourish was one of the, the, I feel, one of the greatest accomplishments of my teaching career. It's harder for a teacher in a group session to give this individual attention to individuals because when you're teaching in a group session, you have to be mindful of keeping your information and demonstrations sort of aligned with the least able students. And that's not an insult. I mean, I could say the average student, but some people just don't get it. And you don't want to see them fall behind, but also talking over someone's head will always lead them to resent you in some way. So you have to find a way to be relevant and pertinent, but also be able to keep everyone motivated and inspired to learn and grow. With all of my music students, I make a point of letting their parents, or they themselves know, that I will always make myself available via email, text, or a, even a brief video chat if problems or issues or questions arise during their regular lesson interval. 
And it's almost with 100% certainty that the exceptional ones will eventually reach out. And with total certainty, the ones who are comfortable with a weekly injection of information never do. So I've been trying to put this script, I guess you could say, together for a couple of weeks now. And it hasn't worked out for me because I have so many thoughts or, or new thoughts. And I want to try and keep this completely relevant. When I was talking about the problem students at the beginning, I, I would always find, if I circle back to that, that on those students' lesson days, I always had a little bit of a, a few moments of not dread or fear, but real concern as to whether I was going to be able to build effectively on what we did last week and deliver some new information or demonstrate some other new technique to them without them speaking out and saying, okay, we already covered that. Let's move on. Let's do something else. And that goes with like technical things or also with students who are exceptional at reading music. Recently in the last two years, I've had a, a few students who not by any real dissatisfaction in their music lessons have stopped their lessons. And many of these were very exceptional students. The one was due to the pandemic. I've had others move out of the country, which is a little hard to do lessons that way, unless it's over the internet, Zoom or whatever. I had a weird sense of relief, but also a profound sense of responsibility to somehow find a way to keep them on track, even though they weren't technically my student any longer. Leading up to those points, every week I had to personally tailor several lessons for those students who are years above where their typical peers would be. And I could talk to them as if they were much older than they actually are, because I knew that they understood. I knew that they were listening and I knew that they would get it and put those lessons and demonstrations to immediate use. So again, it's how to keep things relevant, pertinent, and motivational. It's really hard to do. But if you dig deep into yourself as a teacher and keep reminding yourself that you were there too, what kind of information would you like to have had given to you at those times? Try to find a way to make yourself available to your students so that you can do that. And I'm not saying you know, to, to give them, you know, extra time when there's somebody else waiting for their lesson or anything, but just to let them know that you recognize their exceptionality, that you recognize their talents and their skills. And I believe that makes us better teachers. When we find ourselves in those kind of situations where we have to change our approach to teaching from merely reciting facts or assigning reading or demonstrating some methodology. As teachers, we all have established delivery methods. Certain catchphrases or favorite euphemisms or examples. We've learned what works to convey a point and what does not work. And there are, there are dozens of examples I could cite in my day-to-day -day music lessons. These things just sort of come out of me and I, I don't even realize that I'm saying them until I've said them and I go, yep, that example worked again. It's just like in this situation, this works for this, you know, level of ability of a student, use that. And then you say it and it's done and they get it and we move on. It's also incumbent on us as teachers to be able to grow and flow with the demands of our students and to do that without any kind of arrogance, without any kind of uh, making the student feel as if they're asking for something that they don't deserve when you give them extra attention. Whether you teach in a group or class setting or conduct one-on-one -on -one lessons like I do, your first job is to gain the student's interest and to keep them engaged and motivated and inspired with not only timely information, but also a level of camaraderie that they know you were once a beginner yourself and remind them of that regularly. You also have to strive to maintain a level of empathy and compassion with those people who have come to learn from you. There's your pep talk. Now go get to work. 
Ah, uh, yes. So the problem is a good problem to have. Those exceptional students that keep you on your toes, that keep you thinking, keep you trying to innovate and renovate your methods and not let you be stuck as a teacher. It's tough, but it's what you signed up for. Because if you're a teacher, you want to do it. So how do you make the best of your time with students? You remember what it's like to be a student because it's what you do.